This is Matt Sorum, and I'm here with Zoli from Ocean Hills. Thank you from Pioneer Town, California, in the Yucca Valley. That's right. Thanks for doing this, brother. Oh man, it's good to see you. Good to see Always. You too. So it's funny how all this comes together because I tried out for Velvet Revolver after uh, Scott left. And there was a time you guys were maybe looking for maybe another singer. And um, I wrote this song and, and I sent it to you guys. And it um, didn't work out for one reason or another. And then the song that we're going it, to, it's going to be one of our songs on the new album for Ocean Hills on AFM Records. Uh, well, sh the video was shot like 10 minutes from here. That's cool. Should that one be the, uh, the the next video and the next release? Because they're giving us five releases wow. with five videos. The other one's a little bit more up tempo. Traditionally, in the old days, we'd go with the up tempo. That's why I was kind of leaning to this one because the way of the world right now, it seems yeah. a little bit of like like energy that, and stuff. Yeah, hope. I'm cool with the lyrics. So I understand that. You know, I just I just cut a won't back down cover. I sent it to you. Yeah, that's great. I did it for this uh, hospital in uh, in Brazil that I'm a part of down that I helped at this charity down there. But uh, lyrically, that was like, okay, I get that. I went back down. You know what I mean? So I would say lyrically, yeah. Yeah, they're both great. I mean, I think, you know, now with bands releasing singles, it's almost like bam, bam. You don't have to wait this window anymore. You just start releasing music and, give people a lot. Like if you remember the last Metallica album, they were putting out a video like every couple of weeks. They just pre pretty much presented the record in the content form, right? It's like here. And, and that record ended up selling a million copies for a modern day record. That's a lot of records. And interesting thing, your grandmother's piano is behind us. And we recorded the whole album. The album's called Santa Monica. We recorded record the whole grab, uh, album at my grandmother's house because it's a 200-year-old home. Mm -hmm. It's um, the, the walls are about two feet thick. The floor is wooden, and there's sand underneath the house. Wow. And I was re reading up on Rick Rubin the way he did it, yeah. and he would take these houses that were awesome and really heavy and gnarly mm -hmm. built, and uh, it's one of the best-sounding albums I've ever been on. Yeah. You know what I mean? So, well, so, we're in a hangar right now. This is an old helicopter hangar. And then we, we have another house up the hill that you were at um, that we actually built a studio in an old garage. And I got a killer drum sound in there. So we've created another studio uh, up the hill that Billy Gibbons is coming out here. And I've been trying to get him to come because I love getting people away from distractions. Like you hear about the old bands in England going to get in a castle or they're going to go to the Bahamas or they're going to go to the south of France, the Rolling Stones, when they did Exxon on Main Street, right? They went to France, they rented a chateau, they all lived together. And that was Rick Rubin's theory too. Let's get the band together, let's get a living together, let's feel the energy, right? So that was the idea. When I finally got Billy out here, it was like, the cell phone service isn't very good, number one. Yeah, it's great. Right? So yeah. we're like, oh, uh, no one can get a hold of me. Okay, that's good, right? Or like we're working or I'm creating and living together in a way. So as you know, when you're with the band like that, and I always say to people, the earliest version of the band's recordings are always the best. Why is the first two albums great of any band? Aerosmith, Stones. Stones made a lot of great records, you know, but... Certain bands only have two great records, right? Well, 
before they got the money, when they were all living together in probably some little apartment or they were like a family, a, a team, a gang, you know? Yeah. And then came all the fortune and fame and what happens then? Well, bands break up and, you know, they start fighting. And so conceptually, that was the idea about br bringing Billy out, who's a guy that made so many amazing records in the 70s and ZZ Top started in 1969, all the way through their resurgence in the 80s. And now they have a legacy, so they just continue. But So he's coming and we're going to record. It's great. It's awesome. There's a lot of really great drummers in the world, right? But for me, as a drummer, my, my thing was to serve the song. I'm, I'm here to serve the song. It's not about me. I'm like, I'm a team player. I'm like, this is a band. And everybody, especially in Guns N' Roses, was contributing melodies. Slash played incredible melodies on the guitar. Those solos were worked out. That just wasn't him shredding. Oh, dude. He thought about where that was going to take people emotionally. And then the bass lines that created underneath were very much more in the league of like Paul McCartney, if you listen to the Beatles. The one of the lead instruments is the bass. And then Axel's lyrics with Izzy Stratton's lyrics were the things that really brought the band out of sort of hair metal, if you will, because it had more of a connection to the street and to the average person that could understand what was happening lyrically. Because you know, Axel was a kid from Indiana. You know, he grew up tough, uh, grew up not rich, you know, lower middle class. And uh, so he was speaking to the middle of America. And when, when they opened Welcome to the Jungle and him getting off the Greyhound bus with a piece of wheat in his mouth, right? Here's a kid coming and searching for his dream. He's going to Hollywood. And he meets the drug dealer on the street, remember? Yeah, I love that. And that video. really happened to Axel. So everything that Axel wrote about, he was telling his story. And I, I would say this about singers and singers that I've been fortunate to be in bands with. Every piece of life that he lived, you could feel in the music. Because he lived a pretty interesting life before he became a famous rock star. And same with Slash. Slash grew up in a very artistic family. His mother was... David Bowie's clothing designer. And his father did record covers for Joni Mitchell, uh, a bunch of amazing artists, Roxy Music. Was his mother in, in, uh, in the Jeffersons? Is that? Is that? No, that's no, Lenny, no, Kravitz. Lenny Kravitz. Excuse me, excuse me. Lenny sorry. Kravitz, yeah. Lenny Kravitz. So anyway, Slash grew up in a very creative environment. Duff came from punk rock like you. Yeah. So all the elements of the band, and here I was, a kid from Orange County, who loved progressive rock, right? And I loved, but I loved bands like Deep Purple, and, but I still like Genesis, but, and all the pieces of the puzzle, all these different influences brought the sound. I know you got to run because you have a session tonight, but I was wondering if we can get some air outside and you can tell me how the, the re I heard that the reason uh, the Black Album came to be is because you said something to Lars. 